Yo, what's good, original crew, man? We're back with a new Mr. Ballin. We have the horrific true story behind this teen slasher franchise. What teen slasher franchise could he be talking about, see? Because he already talked about uh, what y'all, right? What? Scream. He already talked about Scream before. You don't remember? Uh-uh. You, you, you really don't remember? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember who's talking about but I can't think of who the, what, like, teen slasher franchise. But I don't know what slasher franchise he could be talking about now. This one, yeah, but... Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's teen, but it's not teen only. Mm, mm. Jason versus Jason? Mm. They were teenagers at the camp? At the camp? Friday? I don't know. Friday 13? I mean, could. I, 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 don't know. I don't know. I don't know. With this one, I I'm don't thinking know. of Slash... What's story called? Behind. What's called? Uh, 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 the dude with the mask, Michael Myers. Michael. Is that Teen Slash? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, uh, with that being said, man, before we get into it today, make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go. If you want the first part, you got to do it. Check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's visuals. Like it with a thumbs up. We trying to think of slasher movies, and I cannot think. Only when I just keep saying slasher, I keep thinking of TV series slasher. And I don't know why my head just keep going back there. <laughs> and then I'm trying to think of my like, true story behind. I'm, I don't know. All right. We'll see. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Let's check it out. Let's see what's about. Let's find out what slash movie we talking about today. Ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Today's story is about four teenage friends who decide to go camping in this big, beautiful forest in Finland that's right near this huge lake. And when they get there, you know, it's awesome. There's so many people there. The weather's perfect. They're having a great time. But that night, it turned into an absolute nightmare because someone or something paid those teens an unwanted visit. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, please offer to change the oil in the like button's car, but after draining it all out, go ahead and replace it with horse manure. Also, please subscribe to our channel. And then if I try to pull off and it be, you know, and my, my, my engine locked the hell up on me, I'm suing you ass. <laughs> then you ain't put the oil back in my car. So. That's trifling. And turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the afternoon of June 4th, 1960, a 15-year-old girl named Mela Bjorklund climbed off the back of her boyfriend's motorcycle. Her boyfriend was an 18-year-old named Nils Gustafsson, and this couple had just driven 18 miles from the city in southern Finland where they lived to get to this beautiful forest and lake where they, along with another couple, were going to go camping. The other couple, who was still a few minutes behind them, was Nils' best friend, Seppo, and his girlfriend, whose name was Anja. As Nils parked his motorcycle, Mela looked out over the lake, and she saw it was totally beautiful, the forest completely wrapped around the lake, and there were all these people out on the lake, boating and swimming and having a great time. But despite all these people here, to Mela, it still kind of felt very quiet and peaceful. This didn't feel like a big touristy destination. It really felt like they were out in the wild. And for Mela, who loved the outdoors, you know, this felt like a great spot to celebrate her 16th birthday. Because that's actually why the couples were out camping. Mela was turning 16 in a couple of days, and so this was going to be her party. Just then, Mela heard... Don't you think you're a little too young to be sneaking out for... I'm just thinking... You 15, you see, don't be going off with no little boys. Y'all out there being managed. Being fast and young and managed. 15, 
He 18. You got no business going driving off with no. Let my 15 year old get your ass on over here now, little girl. Fast ass. Bring your arm. Fast. That's being fast. That's hot in the ass. Even for 1960s, that's still hot in the ass. Y'all supposed to be in the doo wop age. You know what I'm saying? Another motorcycle approaching, and she turned around and she saw it was the other couple. It was Seppo who was driving, and Anja was right behind him. And Seppo, he looked up and saw Mela looking at him, and he grinned and braked hard with his motorcycle and kind of swung the back wheel out like he was in an action movie. And Mela thought it was totally funny and she started laughing. And that's when Nils turned around and he saw his girlfriend laughing heartily at Seppo. A moment later, all four friends were giving each other hugs and saying hello. And then after catching up, the friends walked over to this small shack that was right by the water. It was the snack kiosk. Their plan was to load up on supplies and then quickly make their way into the forest where they'd actually be camping and just relax, enjoy the night and go to bed. But as the friends walked towards the snack kiosk, Seppo made a joke about how his motorcycle was way better than Nils's motorcycle. And Mela, who was Nils's boyfriend, she laughed at this joke and thought it was really funny. But as she was laughing, she happened to look over at Nils, her own boyfriend, and she could tell, you know, he just looked upset, like he was scowling at her and also at Seppo. And immediately, Mela felt really bad because she was thinking, you know, maybe Nils thinks I'm flirting with Seppo by laughing at all of his jokes. And so Mela really did not want Nils to think anything was going on with her and Seppo because there was nothing going on. But when Mela looked over at Nils again to kind of confirm that he really did look mad, he didn't look mad. He was smiling and laughing again. And so Mela told herself, you know, she must have just imagined that, that Nils was never upset. It was all in her head. So Mela reached over and grabbed Nils's hand and the two couples walked the rest of the way over to the kiosk. The snack kiosk was really just this little shack right near the beach. And then behind the shack was a small house where the owners of the snack kiosk lived. And as soon as they got up to the kiosk, Mela noticed the woman who was manning the kiosk had her back to them and didn't seem remotely interested in turning around and helping them get what they needed. And so Mela was just like, okay, hey, excuse me, we just want to buy something. And the woman at this point, she whipped her head around and she looked at Mela really angrily and just said, what do you want? And Mela, who was totally taken aback by this, she kind of mumbled an apology, not really even sure if she did something wrong or not. And then she asked the woman if they could just get a couple of beers and sodas and they'd be on their way. And as this is happening, Seppo and Anja, who were right behind Mela, they were just giggling the whole time because this woman's behavior was so bizarre and so unexpected, they just couldn't help themselves. So as the teenagers are giggling, this woman is bending down and getting the sodas and beer and she's huffing really angrily like this is such a huge inconvenience. And then she just slammed him up on the counter. As the woman was punching in the total into the cash register, Mela found herself looking over at the house behind the shack where this woman presumably lived. And Mela noticed there were all these empty beer bottles that lined the front railing of the house. And so Mela figured, you know, maybe this was a clue as to why this woman was so hostile. Any household that produced that many empty beer cans likely was not a very happy place to live. And so finally, the woman in the kiosk gave the teenagers their total, at which point Nils stepped forward and he actually paid for the stuff instead of Mela. And then as Nils and Mela grabbed the things they bought and were about to turn and leave, the woman in the kiosk kind of cleared her voice and she asked them, you know, hey, are you camping out by the lake? And to Mela, it seemed like this woman was suddenly being really nice, maybe as a way to kind of make up for how rude she was when they first walked over. And so Mela put on a smile and told this woman that, yeah, you know, we're staying out by the lake. We're really excited about it. You know, thanks for asking. But the woman did not seem happy to hear this. Instead, the woman kind of scowled and then told them that they better set their tent as far away from here as possible. None of the teenagers had any idea how to respond to this. So they just kind of stood there and there was this really intense, awkward silence for a moment. And then the kiosk lady just began literally shooing the teenagers away, telling them to go, get out of here. And so finally the teenagers did turn around and started walking. But after walking- I don't even like her ass. Issue. I'm gonna shop. I'm gonna shop shit with her ass. I mean, well, they needed those little yeah, things to that. keep them overnight. Yeah, there, go home. Why you? You 15 sneaking okay. off with your 18 year old boyfriend to go sleep in the woods to celebrate your birthday? We all know she's trying to get that birthday set. <laughs> How my boy Jeremiah sing it? <laughs> Come on now, like off in the woods. 
What year was this? And he just said 1960. Mm. So, you know what I'm saying? They fa- little fast, hard that. But you drink your water. Dang, what you... T- well, you got you got some kind of vendetta against me? Trying to force me to drink? Mm-hmm. That's like telling me, be quiet, shut up and drink, bitch. <laughs> so dramatic. Out of here. And so finally, the teenagers did turn around and started walking. But after walking pretty far away from the kiosk, they heard the kiosk woman yell out at them one more time. She basically yelled at them that her and her family had already had lots of trouble with wild teenagers in the past camping out around this lake. And so now she and her husband were totally sick of it. And so after the kiosk lady yelled out this final comment, Seppo and Nils and Anja, they just started laughing because it just seemed so absurd how disrespectful and awful this woman was being to the point where it was comical. But Mela, she didn't think it was funny. She seemed mean and very angry and it totally freaked Mela out. But just a couple of minutes later, the teens were back at their motorcycles and Nils and Mela hopped on one and Seppo and Anja hopped on the other. And then they began driving down this wooded path that would take them to their campsite. The ride to their campsite was a very short one. And where they were positioned was on this piece of land that sort of jutted out onto the lake. It was very heavily forested. And so it's this amazing view of the water, but it's very secluded in the trees. And so right away, Nils and Seppo, they parked their motorcycles up against the trees. They pulled out a simple canvas tent and they strung it up between two birch trees. And then with their campsite all set up, they grabbed some beers and the friends began to drink. And it didn't take long before Mela had totally forgotten about the kiosk woman and how awful she had been. After all, Mela had really been looking forward to this trip. And now she was here at the campsite, relaxing with her friends. I mean, this was great. Also, Mela was really excited about her relationship with Nils. It was a relatively new one. And it was obvious that, you know, for once, her boyfriend was somebody who liked her as much as she liked him. And also Nils was very handsome and he was popular and he had this dark brown hair that he combed straight up and he always wore this leather jacket everywhere. And so Mela just really liked being around him. He was super cool and made her feel really grown up. After sitting around for about 30 minutes to an hour, just having a couple of drinks and swapping stories and kind of easing into their night, the friends eventually made their way down to the water and they went swimming for a while and they continued to drink down by the dock. And then when they were tired of swimming, the teens just laid on the dock and enjoyed looking out at the sunset. Even though actually in Finland at this time of the year, it's not really a sunset because the sun does not actually fully set. And so when this happens, these are known as white nights, which are very beautiful. I mean, it's kind of like this hazy glow in the sky from the sun not quite setting and so on this night the teens are out there on the dock they had this beautiful you know white night to look up at and for Mela she felt like this was the perfect birthday celebration in fact she would jot down in her diary later that night just how amazing everything was going and how much fun she was having with Nils and their friends Finally, the teens were done down by the docks. They grabbed their things. They went back up to the campsite. They dried off. They changed. And then all four of them piled into their one little tent to go to sleep. And eventually, all four of them would drift off to sleep. But then at some point in the middle of the night, Mela woke up. And she heard rustling sounds outside the tent. And so she wondered if, you know, maybe one of the friends had gotten up. And so she sat up and looked out the tent and she couldn't see anything. She just saw the kind of hazy night sky from the white night. And she couldn't really tell if everybody was inside the tent or not. But then suddenly a dark shadowy figure moved in front of the tent flap, the open tent flap. And so this shadowy figure totally blocked all the light that was coming into the tent from the white night. And then this shadowy figure looked into the tent and they had these bright glowing red eyes. And before Mela or anybody else in the tent could do anything, there was a snapping sound and the tent fell down on top of them. The next morning at 6 a.m., two boys who were not in any way connected to these four teenagers were at this lake. They were over to the side doing some fishing, and they were looking kind of out generally in the direction of where the four teenagers had stayed the night before. And this particular day, the lake was not remotely crowded like it was the day before. Basically, it was a ghost town. And suddenly, they saw emerge from the forest, basically where the teens had camped, was this young man with blonde hair who was just running away from where that campsite was. And so these boys just stared for a second at this random guy with blonde hair running away from the campsite until the boys lost interest and just went back to fishing. As the morning wore on, more and more people came to the lake, 
but nobody made their way out to the campsite where the teenagers had been the night before. That is, until a father and his two sons decided to head out that way to go to that dock to go swimming. And so this father and his sons began walking on the same wooded trail that Nils and Seppo had driven their motorcycles on to get out to that camping site. And he eventually makes it to the clearing in the forest where this campsite was. And right away, he spots what looks like a crumpled heap of canvas kind of sitting between two trees. And he couldn't really tell what it was. And so the father walked a little bit closer to investigate and eventually he realized what they were actually walking up on, at which point he threw up a hand to stop his sons from going any closer, and he turned around and he told his kids, we have to leave right now. And so the father and his sons, they run back up that trail, they find a phone, and they call the police. When the police arrived at the lake just before noon, they would walk out to that campsite and they would see that crumpled heap of canvas, and then also in and around that crumpled heap were the four bodies of the four teenagers who had stayed there the night before. Anja and Seppo had not even made it out of the tent. They had been beaten and stabbed to death, basically through the canvas fabric. Mela did manage to get out of the tent. However, she did not escape. She was kind of laying on top of the tent and she had broken bones. And it would turn out she was stabbed a total of 15 times. And some of those stabs came when she was alive and some came when she was dead. And then laying next to her was the body of her boyfriend Nils. And he was basically unrecognizable. His head had been beaten to a pulp. As officers descended on the scene and began rifling through the teenagers' backpacks and different belongings, one officer knelt down near all the victims to look more closely at each of their injuries. And I wonder, did Niels even fight back for him to be beat the way he... Because uh, Andre and Seppo, they were killed in the... In the tent. In the tent. So they probably was two of the first ones to get attacked. You get what I'm saying? And Mila... And keep in mind... Ma Mila... Mila, Mila. Mila. Okay. Keep in mind, um, they were all asleep. She was the only one that had woke up because she heard the noise. So I'm wondering, once the tents, like, once it had failed, so like, I, on them, yeah. did they wake up as well? Yeah. And wasn't able to fight back because of how, you know, they kind of trapped underneath, you know, fabric, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But she was already kind of, like, looking out, maybe because she, she was up. Yeah. So... But, but Neil's got for him to be some... beat the way he was beat. Yeah, he had to have been one of the main ones that was possibly fighting back. Possibly. And out of anger, you get, the, you know, what I'm saying the most because you probably the most of a threat. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Officers descended on the scene and began rifling through the teenagers' backpacks and different belongings. One officer knelt down near all the victims to look more closely at each of their injuries. And as they were looking at each of the victims, they suddenly heard this gasping sound. It was very faint, but they could definitely hear it. And to their shock, Nils, so Mela's boyfriend, he suddenly opened his eyes and he looked up at this officer. Wow. He was still alive. What? And this officer who's seeing this, who was totally convinced Nils was dead, as everybody else was, was at first unsure what to even do. But then a second later, the officer stood up and began screaming for a medic. After Nils was taken away in an ambulance, the different investigative teams that had descended on the scene began going over the evidence and different things they had found. And pretty quickly, the general feel amongst all the investigators was this crime scene does not make any sense. There were some things missing from the crime scene that seemed to indicate this could have been a robbery, like missing wallets and missing watches. But there were other things that were missing that just didn't really make any sense to have been taken. Like, for example, the two motorcycles that the boys drove in, they were still there, parked up against the tree, but their keys were gone. So why steal the keys and not take the motorcycles? And then also, Nils's prized leather jacket and his shoes were also missing. These were not particularly valuable. I mean, they might have been emotionally valuable to Nils, but they certainly were not valuable enough to warrant a robber, you know, killing people to get their hands on them. So eventually, the police actually called in the military to come into the forest and help with the search. And when the military arrived and began fanning out all around this huge forest, they would make a really big discovery. They would find Nils's shoes. And these shoes were speckled with blood. And it was clear from the bloody tracks nearby that the killer must have, at some point, put these shoes on at the campsite and then walked away while still wearing them and then ultimately, you know, ditched them 500 meters away underneath that pile of leaves. In the days after the murders, the police chased down dozens of leads all over Finland, but none of them amounted to anything. 
Nils would actually survive the attack, but his face was so badly damaged with so many broken bones in his head that it took a really long time before he could even speak. Wow. But when he finally could and the police were able to interview him, it became immediately clear that Nils did not have a good memory of the attack. And in fact, the day of the attack, basically the whole day, he didn't really remember it. However, Nils would remember one thing. He said during the chaos of the actual attack, he distinctly remembered seeing a dark, shadowy figure with these bright red, glowing eyes. But the police couldn't just go out and look for a dark figure with red eyes, and so instead they just made a note of this and continued their investigation. The only real lead the police got were from those two boys who were fishing out on the lake a day after the murders happened, where they saw that guy with blonde hair running away from where the teens had camped. Now, these two boys didn't know the significance of what they were seeing, but obviously when the news broke about the murders, they were called seeing that guy right in the area where they now knew, you know, that's where the murders had happened. And so the police created a composite sketch of, you know, what the boys thought they saw, this blonde guy running, and they would send this sketch all over Finland. And they would ask people, you know, to come forward if you've seen this guy. And loads and loads of people immediately came forward and said, yep, I've seen that guy. But it would turn out the police were getting loads of false reports because the sketch looked like lots of men in Finland. So this was not a unique enough sketch, basically. However, there was one tip that came into police that did really stand out. The day after the murders happened, a man named Hans Osman checked into a hospital located about 13 miles away from where the lake was, where the murders happened. And this guy Hans, when he checks into the hospital, he starts complaining of having these really intense stomach pains. But the doctors don't believe him because Hans actually just appears to be very drunk and very aggressive. First of all, he looked exactly like the police composite sketch of the blonde running guy. Like he was that guy. And also, Hans was filthy. He was covered in dirt and mud, and there was all this dirt kind of embedded in his fingernails like he had been digging with his hands. And he also had all these red stains all over his clothes that he refused to explain. Mm. And so eventually, one of the doctors called the police, and when the police interviewed Hans, they would discover that he had a history of violence, and he also said he used to be a member of the Nazi party, and he also was a member of the Russian secret police. And all of this just seemed like a lie, but basically he seemed like a very erratic and unstable person. But Hans had a rock solid alibi. On the night of the murder, Hans was located in a city about 15 miles away from where the murders happened at his girlfriend's house with his girlfriend and also his girlfriend's sister and brother-in-law. And so as much as they wanted Hans to be their guy, the police learned, you know, obviously he's not. And this was basically how the entire investigation went. The police would interview over four... Th but the thing is, with, with a lot of lot of alibis like those, those could be very fabricated. Yeah, because if you have like, like, okay, your girlfriend and who else you say? Like those people, we've known like stories like this and people lie for people. Exactly. Or it'd be like they were here. We all went to sleep at some point. But he could have got, got up. He could have got up. Or y'all could have left at a certain point. We don't know the exact time yeah. of death. We don't so know. Uh, Fifteen miles ain't that far. Facts. So he could have he could have did that and then made it back, and y'all didn't even anyone know. Anyone ever recognizing? You know what I'm saying? So we'll see though. Not just they wanted Hans to be their guy. The police learned, you know, obviously he's not. And this was basically how the entire investigation went. The police would interview over 4,000 people, but despite all that, they still could not figure out who did this. And so slowly, the case went cold. And that was it for 44 years. Lots of theories, but not one suspect. But then in 2004, prosecutors made a stunning announcement. They said the killer was Nils Gustafsson the 18-year-old boyfriend of Mela, who was the only one who survived the attack. And the prosecutors pointed to two pieces of evidence to support this theory. The first piece of evidence was there was this woman who was staying out at the lake on the night of the murders, not far from the teenager's campsite, who remembered overhearing two men really aggressively fighting before the murders ultimately happened. Prosecutors hypothesized that what that woman overheard was Nils and Seppo fighting with each other that Nils was mad at Seppo about something to do with Nils' girlfriend, Mela. You know, perhaps he really was upset that it seemed like Mela was flirting with Seppo, and so Nils felt betrayed, but, you know, something was... I kind of, 
I, I kind of went there in my head, but I didn't want to go there because I was like, he could be a victim if he's beaten that bad. But you can't do that much damage to yourself because of jealous, jealous rage. Jealous that Seppo is low-key flirting with my girl. My girl, she's laughing back. You know, and Andre like, just what? Andre just was just it's hatred. I, I wanted to go there, but I didn't want to really go there. But we're gonna hear it out. Seppo about something to do with Nils's girlfriend, Mela. You know, perhaps he really was upset that it seemed like Mela was flirting with Seppo, and so Nils felt betrayed, but, you know, something was happening there where these two young men were fighting over a girl. In the prosecutor's eyes, this would also explain why Mela had been stabbed so many times. That basically Nils must have been so furious about whatever was happening between Mela and Seppo, and then, you know, his rage took over and he really took it out on his girlfriend. The second piece of evidence the prosecutors used to support this idea that Nils was the killer were Nils's shoes, which were found under those leaves about 500 meters away from their campsite. The prosecutor said there was blood on the shoes, but not in the shoes. And none of the blood that were on these shoes belonged to Nils. And so prosecutors say that shows Nils murdered his friends while wearing his shoes and then, you know, ran away from the campsite and ditched those shoes to hide them, you know, underneath those leaves. And then he came back to the campsite and inflicted those horrible injuries on himself to make it seem like he also had been attacked. So in the end, Nils, 44 years after the fact, got arrested for these murders. And at the time he was arrested, Nils was 62 years old, he was working as a bus driver, and he was married with kids. But at Nils's trial, he absolutely maintained his innocence and did not waver from his story one bit. He basically said, look, I can't remember all the details of that day. I don't remember the attack very well. I don't really know what we did leading up to it, what happened after it. But what I do remember is I saw a dark shadowy figure with glowing red eyes. That's all I remember. And the jury completely believed him, and he was easily acquitted, and in the end, Finland would even give him a huge monetary settlement for his mental suffering. Today, people tell lots of stories about these murders. I mean, the lake itself where this happened, Lake Bodum, is now completely famous for these murders. People go there just to be in the same place where these teens were killed. But a lot of the stories that circulate about these murders are so far-fetched that they just do not seem believable, like suggesting that the campsite was cursed and that, you know, the ghosts of murdered campers attacked the teens. It just does not seem like a viable theory. Other stories that circulate are really intriguing, but they don't really get you anywhere. Like periodically there's this photo that will circulate on the internet, and it's a picture of the crowd at one of the teens' funerals, and in the middle of this crowd is this guy whose face looks identical to that composite sketch of the running blonde man. And in fact, people have come out and said he looks exactly like that guy Hans Osman, who had shown up in the hospital, you know, the day after the murders with the dirt and what looked like blood all over him, but he had that alibi. And so that picture makes its rounds on the internet and everybody gets jazzed up and says, there he is, that's the guy who killed the teens. But no one's ever been able to actually identify that person, and so it's gone nowhere. But there is one story that circulates about these murders that a lot of people believe is the truth. When the teenagers were killed, there was a 55-year-old man named Carl Voldemar Gilstrom who lived right on Lake Bodum. And Carl had a reputation for being really nasty and sometimes even lashing out at the campers who stayed in this area. And in fact, Carl would often get drunk and literally go and attack the other campers. He would cut down their tents in the middle of the night. He would throw rocks at their campsite. And then one time, he even fired a gun at a camper who was riding past him on a moped. He missed, but I mean, this guy is an absolute nightmare. And so after the murders happened, locals who knew about Carl immediately went to police and they were like, that's the guy who very likely did this. I mean, this is totally something he would do. But when police went and tried to speak to Carl, they wound up speaking to Carl's wife, who was the kiosk woman, the woman who was so nasty to the teens when they first arrived and basically told them to get away. Yeah, so the police talked to her and she would tell police that Carl was with her and her kids when the murders happened. And so the police believed her and never really considered Carl a serious suspect. But in the Lake Bodum area, when people heard he was not being looked at closely, people felt like this was a huge mistake. 
But nine years after the murders, so at this point the case is totally cold, Carl is having a drink with his neighbor out near the Lake Bodum area, and as they're just sitting there having drinks, relaxing, Carl winds up admitting to the neighbor that he was the Lake Bodum murderer. He literally said to his neighbor, don't you understand that I'm the murderer of Bodum? And the neighbor apparently was so caught off guard and so horrified by this that they said to Carl, well, if that's the truth, you should go drown yourself. And then the next day, where was Carl found? Out in the lake, drowned right near where the teens had been attacked. Now, the police were never able to actually wow. figure out if his death was accidental or wow. if he had done it to himself or if somebody else had done it to him, but that's the story. And lots of people believe that Carl was so racked with guilt over what he had done that he did what his neighbor suggested. Mm. Are you a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious? So what the fuck slash movie is this from? I just think it's the... Uh... Aww. Yeah, that gotta threw be... me. But it gotta be something connected to it for you to even title it that. But um, you got any? You wanna say? I, I got a lot. Uh, you do have a lot. I'm just gonna say this. I don't think it was Neil's. You don't. I don't. You don't. I don't. You don't. I, I, Cause. No, that that's all. I was like, okay, I know we brought him up because he was looked at or whatever the case may be, but I just don't think that he did that and then inflicted those wounds happens, on though. himself. Uh, yeah, it, it does happen. It definitely and does happen. Peep this. Everybody was stabbed except for Nils. Nils was the only one that was head bashed. That's all. He wasn't stabbed. So you're gonna tell me you're gonna stab everybody else except for Nils? Mm. And Nils could have so much head head trauma where you don't remember the attacks. But you tell me you don't remember anything from that day at all. Only thing you remember is a is a shadowy figure with red eyes. That's the only thing you remember. Sometimes, sometimes you, that's some not gonna be the only remember. thing you remember. I feel what you're saying, but I I I feel what you're saying. I, again, you can go either way, especially when it was never really solved. Don't know. You have someone, you know, confessing to the neighbor, and then you have people looking like whatever the sketch is that some, you know, two boys like mm -hmm. said that they see. So you really don't know. But I don't know. Just for some reason, I don't feel like it was him. But then you have a woman saying she heard some young men arguing. Or whatever the case may be, but it just doesn't. So, so peep this: What if Carl, because he's typically messing with the kids, right? Mm -hmm. He could have pushed the tents over. He mm -hmm. could have did that that night, but that doesn't necessarily mean he murdered them, right? We just know the tents was pushed over that night. How do we even know the tents were pushed over that night? The tents tents could have collapsed while while doing the struggle. We don't really know because who would have survived to say somebody pushed the tents over that night? Only person, Nils. Nils said he doesn't remember much that night. You, you piece, piecing stuff together? Or you or you forcing yourself to block out a certain thing? So let's just say Carl pushed it. He could have pushed the tents over that night while they were asleep. Then startled them and woke them up, right? Then boom, bam. Nils and Seppo got into an argument. Nils is already frustrated anyways. This wakes them up. They get into a heated argument already. This Neil uh, or some kind of interaction between Seppo and uh, Mela could have happened after that. Mm -hmm. And Neil's got pissed off. They got to arguing. And that's, you know, everything went ballistic between Neil's and Seppo. Not saying that's true, but it could be a possibility. Then you won't be able to tell who was killed first. Won't be able to tell that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But Mela, for her to be stabbed so many times while she's alive and deceased, that's more out of personal. You know what I'm saying? Because typically, if you're going to stab somebody, you don't know them. You don't stab them that many times. And also, by the time they fall down, you know they're not like a threat anymore. You move on. And 
you telling me one individual can do this to three individuals that they personally don't know, two boy, two boys or two girls. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Unless he a big individual that, but he's gonna have some defense wounds on himself some type of way. He's gonna. So that's the reason why Hans does look suspicious. Hans even looks suspicious. Yeah, he does. Every I, I say this, you won't be able to say exactly who did it, but you can come up with a hypothesis or some kind of assumption of why each individual is a clear suspect. Carl, you have a reputation of doing certain things. You and your wife, y'all have hatred towards the teens in the area. Mm-hmm. We don't also don't know what kind of commotion they, if they or if, even if they had any commotion once they got to the to the lake. We don't know if they were loud. You know how kids are, eighteen to fifteen to eighteen. We we all been there. Mm-hmm. We've been loud. Um, nobody can tell us nothing. We you know what I'm saying, especially without supervision. We wild. Mm-hmm. So and they on the motorcycles. You know how young people are when, especially when it's motorcycles. So Carl, his wife could been pissed off, and he's like, you know what? I'm gonna go do something about it. Could have attacked him that night. His wife helped him get. But my thing is, if if all these attacks and this the only time you murder somebody, why them? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There would be more of a motive to kill them, <laughs> and if you haven't killed anyone else, you just only scared or. And attack people before, but you haven't murdered anyone, or have you? And it just wasn't reported. But then I feel like if Carl can live with that the murder for nine years, why all of a sudden one day he just ends up dead? Somebody, I would say that was an excuse. Somebody probably killed him. Neighbor could have killed him because you it wasn't determined whether or not. Uh, how he died, so his neighbor could have killed him and said, "Hey, he had confessed to me that he had killed them kids." You said it wasn't determined how who died. Carl, I'm saying like whether it was an accidental drowning or he did it himself, yeah, or somebody killed him. They couldn't tell. Yeah, they just know he he, he was, drowned. He drowned, mm-hmm. but they don't know if it was. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So mm-hmm. in reality, who the the guy could have said, "Hey, he admitted to me that he did," and I told him. Hey, you ought to go drown you drown yourself. Mm-hmm. You don't tell somebody, hey, go drown yourself. You tell them, hey, go kill yourself or something like that. But you don't specifically say, hey, you go drown. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They could have had an altercation or some kind of else type of argument that led to something. He that was his excuse to say, well, yeah, we had a conversation. You know what I'm saying? And his wife probably can vouch, or you know, his wife could have did it. You don't know, you know, especially times back then. A lot of people got away with a lot of crimes back then. Facts, they did. So, Hans, I wish they had dig more further into him, but yeah. never did. And unfortunately, they didn't have a DNA kit back then. You know, because just because somebody got a red smudge on the shirt, that could have came from clay. It could have came from blood. Could have came from brick. Yeah. What did he do as a job? We don't really don't know, know. Mm-hmm. cause his hands are dirty. Uh, everything. Like everything, yeah. he's just filthy, dirty guy. That doesn't necessarily mean he killed somebody. Yeah. And then did we see any literature marks on him? Typically, with somebody stabbing somebody, you're gonna typically cut yourself as well, right? Yeah. You're gonna have some type of scratch or something. So I wonder, did Neil's ever have any scratches or cuts or anything? True. It's just it's just something about like Neil's not remembering anything from that day. That kind of like a red flag. You don't remember not anything. But only thing you remember is... And the shoes. Yeah. And they the two individuals said... The two young boys that was fishing, they said they saw a, somebody young run. Blonde head, but he's not a blonde head, though. True. That's the only thing. And true, 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 true. true. But they could have just saw somebody running by. That doesn't necessarily mean that whoever that was running by did anything to them. Right. So that could have just been, you know, they just telling you what they seen because yeah. it was just, you know, in the moment of things. Yeah. But that person probably didn't have anything to do with it. But I guess with them giving a sketch of kind of the glimpse of the person they seen. Mm-hmm. I guess so many people back then look like the sketch. You know what I'm saying? For you to go question this person, this person, and then they're coming, people coming forward saying, hey, I know who that is, but, you know, you meet a dead end because 
these people have alibis. So, and and that, it's, mm. does the shoes throw off any red flags to you? The only thing, the shoes just don't make sense to me because I'm like, okay, if Neil's put his on, if we're going off of, he said, you know, going off the story that Neil probably put, Neil's put his own shoes on and then walked them. No, he so, already had the shoes on. He just, but the blood and stuff on the shoes. Okay, if Neil had his own shoes on. And he wanted and to then, fake it, make it look like it was like a, 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 just, somebody tried to rob us. So they took some of, took, took some of my things. But then took why would I not... Things. I took the the motorcycle sh- but keys. you didn't have the shoes well, if that was the case, because they found the shoes. With, I don't know. that The shoes just don't make sense to me as far as like them being found not too far away under some leaves. Or could that, the keys and, and the other things that were stolen... Be in the being water, a, the lake. Be in the lake. Under, but I'm just like... The only thing that's... Because my thing is, if somebody... If I bash your head in, blood is going to be on me. Why... Everybody else's blood is on your shoes, except for yours. But we don't know. He did say that. Did he, he said say he that? said everybody everybody else's blood, each individual blood traced back to on the shoes except for Neil. Oh. Neil's, Neil's. I guess I kind of like Neil's. Was, Neil's was the only person that did have his blood DNA on the shoes. Everybody else's DNA was on the shoes. So you saying he did what he did with his own shoes on? Went and disposed of them, and then came back, and then did that to himself. Could. Lay there, hoping someone find them. Not necessarily. Later. He could have possibly tried to kill himself. But okay, but and then. But what I'm saying is, you beat you beat yourself up, and then you just lay there because you know you're not dead. Like you know that you're still. You know what I'm saying? So you just lay there, hoping someone find you. Of it, because me personally, because this could have been a popular camp. Uh, because camp me personally, too. okay, say for instance that happened. And I go back and do that to myself. I'm not just about to lay there and hope somebody find me. I'm going to, like, go and find help as if someone did it to me. Like, you know, make it more like, I don't know. It's just like. But, that, 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 but the way you making it, the way you would do it, <laughs> I'm going to automatically suspect you too, though. Either because way it go, you're going you to survive. Su- either way it go, you're going to suspect me. Not not if we find you, you laying there in your own pool of blood. We thinking you're assuming you dead. <laughs> That would be more believable because like, oh I mean, God. yeah, it may be more believable, but I don't know. I, I sometimes with situations like this, I can't really wrap my head around because it's not something that I would do or think of and, doing. And true. So I, I just try to put myself in like someone that's like kind let, of. Let me ask you this: Who uh, between the two of us, who is more prone to would would be a criminal? And I ain't necessarily saying a murderer. And saying, I'm just saying a criminal. I'm not going to answer that question. Like, I'm just saying, let's be real. Who would be more more prone to be a criminal out of me and you? Calm down. He's like, oh, wait a minute. Criminals? <laughs> like, I'm just saying, like, nine times out of ten. Okay, you. To be you, a criminal. And you. that's the reason why I have certain thoughts that I have. Not saying I, I'm, yeah, I would probably, act upon some shit. You just never know, though. So it's... You never know. You don't see for that lot. I mean, you never know when you, you know, you but, never know how far people will go, for real. But, so, I can't, me personally, because I don't think like that. And I've done, guess, and I've done yeah, okay. criminal things. Okay, but, anyway, but I, I, that's, my, that's my thing. You don't know how far people will go in certain situations. So, me personally, knowing that I I just know, I know myself, and I know I will never do it anything like that. You. It's not in me, so I can't. I'm really trying to put myself in someone that and that's would do the something why like I can, that. That's the reason why I can think. think but like I guess that. it will. Make but more, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't gonna go and kill nobody. Yeah, but I guess it will make more sense to. Okay, whatever he possibly did this to his girlfriend and his friends, and then it's believable. It's then possible. beat myself up, and then lay there because I'm. I know nine times out of ten, someone's gonna eventually find me. Because this is a, you know, mm-hmm. a heavy traffic as far as, like, people coming to the lake, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, fishing, swimming, whatever. So, I know someone is going to eventually find me. So, I guess it would be more believable to just lay here and then when the police come, then just, like, <gasps> wake up. And then they like, oh, my gosh, rush me to the hospital. You will never suspect that I'm involved as well because y'all thought that I was deceased. I wonder how they ever did a lot of tests on me. That would be 
horoscope to see if he is lying about it and if he remember anything from that day. But then where were his where where did he take his jacket? Like nothing. He could have he could have got everything could have been like that's it is a staged robbery. Yeah. Because you still while you still but I would have got a motorcycle. I would have got one of y'all motorcycles unless Especially back then, y'all ain't finding y'all ain't finding motorcycles and cars and shit. Like those times, times ain't like how it is now. And I'm talking about my I'm thing, talking from experience. My thing is, it this must be if, if Niels did have something to do with this, this had to be like a build up type of rage. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Over yeah. time, like you like. This is my opportunity. Pre, like, about yeah, like premeditated. Especially since you know she wanted to, uh, what's her name? Which one? My. Mayla. 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 Yeah. Since she wanted to go out for her birthday and then Mayla. you, you know, you're her man, you know, whatever. You her little boyfriend. And but her, then, her, her and Seppo was laughing a little too much. Together. And then yeah. Seppo and, you know, Anja. 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 You know, y'all know that y'all going out here. Maybe he was like, this is my perfect opportunity to whatever. And he had to take Anja out, even though she ain't had nothing to do with anything. Had to. Had you know to. what I'm saying? If, if we're going off, leave going no with Neil's being no the person. Witnesses. Especially, like you said, if um, everyone else was stabbed to death. And, and then wasn't. you're the, if, if I'm not mistaken. You're the only I, survivor without any stab wounds. If he was stabbed, I'm sure Baldwin would have said. My thing is, like, I, and I just, I also can't even, like, picture myself inflicting so much, like, pain on, pain yourself. on myself. Where Plenty I'm people like, have done it. Where though. I'm, like, unrecognizable. People have done After it. After a while, I'm like, girl, get People Girl, have shit done hurt. it. Stop. People you know have what I'm saying? I know people have done it. And that's just like another thing. I can't wrap my head around because I just wouldn't do nothing like that. Yeah. So it's just like, I don't... It's unbelievable it's, because you wouldn't do it yourself, but people have done that's it. That's why I'm trying to like put my mind, put myself in someone's shoes like that that just got so much probably rage probably if, we, if we're going yeah. off of that. But then, okay, but then why would Carl confess? Like, why would you do that? I don't think Carl actually confessed. My, you think I, that I told the, you. the neighbor just made up this bro, elaborate story? Nine years to... ago, we still in the system, bro. They they can't even they can't solve shit back then, especially honestly. Wait, like, he hold said, on, hold on. Let's be real. Let in this. other foreign countries, they weren't even able to solve, solve Malcolm X murder. They can't solve John F. Kennedy murder. Them high profile murders. Y'all in America with a with a criminal and justice system is more advanced than any other. You can't even, Finland ain't finna solve that. So so Carl confessed nine years after the, the murders. murders actually happened, but the murders went cold for forty four years, right? Forty four. Why did the neighbor never? Did the neighbor ever go to the police and say, "Hey, Carl"? The neighbor to the neighbor. I guess the neighbor told told them that he, he confessed to him. But they after they found the body, the neighbor killed Carl. And, yeah, and use that, and use use that, that. as an as a excuse for Carl committing suicide. How many people going to commit suicide by drowning? I'm talking about like that. <laughs> and a lake. Yeah. They just, come on. How let, did make the neighbor sense. look? I don't think the neighbor killed the kids. No, bro. that's all I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just saying because what would be your reason for... At this point, I'm like, what would be your reason for even if taking Carl out? Unless maybe they got. I told you, maybe they just got maybe animosity. Maybe they had animosity. Could have been. Could have been an affair. Could have been I, a lot knows? of lot of things. Who knows? The, the wife could have hired him. The wife, she evil too. So I'm telling and you. And then my also my thing is like with Niels, for instance, like you know, if since y'all never really solved it, and he was a suspect at one point, then you got Carl possibly. And then you got what was the other man? Ha, 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 Hans. You got him. So you got three possible suspects, right? Mm -hmm. Why are we even like honoring Niels, not even really knowing for sure, just sure. because you know, yeah. like, and then we his pay story him. is believable. Then y'all pay him for possibly being a victim. I mean, possibly being, being a, a sus suspect, but. Even though he wasn't convicted, that's that's right there is weird as hell. Too. And technically, I'm like, we just going off of his word yeah. and possibility. So it's never, it's not really like, oh, he's clear. Stone, yeah, he's clear. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So that's kind of weird to me. And then Carl will never really know because he's, you know, deceased. And now Hans don't know. Now he's deceased. Now he's so. deceased. Yeah. So y'all let us know, man. I mean, it could have been Niels. I just can't. Y'all let us know in the comments, Dang. man. Okay, let us know, y'all. <laughs> you. You just, 
I don't know. Okay. But uh, also, if y'all know the Slash movie he's he's referencing, let us know in the comments because I still ain't guessed it. I'm probably do some uh, digging uh, yeah. to find out myself. But if you find out before I do, let us know in the comments. But as always, man, y'all know how it go. I do go by the name DJ New Kid. This is we are we are. Dollar, 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 let me watch out for my pop.